Well, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in, in the Pacific Islands, well, we're going to go much further than that <laughs> with Christopher Cottrell, who's a journalist. And, you know, most of it, most of the professional life is right to say that uh, in, in China and Asia, and centered in Bangkok right now. And if he writes any, any way like he talks, he's a fire hydrant. You're a fire hydrant, uh, actually, Chris. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks, Thanks for having me on, Jane. It's nice to be on a Hawaiian media channel. Um, I got my start, really, I would say, um, as a, a Pacific journalist um, in Hawaii, writing for uh, Boston Globe, was always pitching stories, um, LA Times Travel. Then I got my uh, big break, hired as the obituary writer at the Honolulu oh, okay. Star Bulletin. Well, it was called the Star Bulletin in those days. Um, while I was studying Pacific Islands history at uh, UH Manoa. Then I graduated in 2002 and moved to Asia full time. And I last 20 years, I've been based 18 out of China and the last two out of Thailand. And you speak Mandarin. I thought so. Yes. Uh, what, what does that mean? It means, yes, I can speak Chinese. And that's all I can say. <laughs> <Joking>. um, sure. <laughs> I'm sure it's more than that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm really interested in journalists who, who make it to Asia and who spend a career, if you will, in Asia. I mean, it's very exciting to think of moving like that and being comfortable where you are, relatively speaking. Uh, I, I was telling you before the show that, you know, I always thought that being in the Foreign Service was a, a great way to spend your, your time and appreciate the world. Um, but, you know, a, a journalist actually has a better deal. Um, so why? Why did you study journalism in the first place? How do you see yourself as, a, you know, an evolving journalist? And okay. why Asia? Uh, all good questions. I wanted to be a journalist, I think, so, since I was like a kid. I thought that would be neat to go to foreign countries and be a correspondent um, and write. I thought that's that's something that appealed to me. So I pursued um, two ways to do that. I studied anthropology and history, which allows you to um, um, have a better grasp of context. Yeah. And cultures. I thought uh, covering the local uh, city, you know, town hall, my um, home of California was fun. And I did break my teeth freelancing earlier in Berkeley, California. Um, city council, these kind of small things before I moved out to Hawaii for graduate school. Um, journalism has changed constantly over the course I've been writing, I'd say, since 1998, with the death of kind of print journalism, the rise of online, and then in 2007 with mobile phone media, which turns everything inside out, upside down, and allows also uh, good programs like yours to emerge as well. So uh, we're always changing and adapting, and also in that same period, We've seen extraordinary growth of globalization um, with the rise of China being, I think, um, a central piece of this new history. So uh, when I was a student at UH Manoa, I got invited to Dr. Daniel Kwok's China seminars, which he oh, would have. Sure. I remember it well at the Maple Garden. Yeah. Yeah. I love Maple Garden. So yeah. um, I would go hang out there um, once a month, get my free food while I signed people in and listen to the stories of new China that was emerging. And I thought, I've got to be over there now. And I heard that from a lot of the speakers who were there. A lot of the uh, Blue Bloods in Hawaii said the same thing. Like, you've got to get to China and report on it. And having that grounding um, in Maple Gardens with uh, Dr. Kwok was really important. And that, that's really interesting that, you know, that a lot of the seminal things that happened to you were here in Hawaii. Oh, in absolutely, Hawaii. yes. It was, it was, it was really transformative. And I've kept nice links with my former professors um, over the years to chat about the Pacific, to chat about China. I try to get back every couple of years. Um, I should be back sooner, hopefully, <laughs> rather than later. But I'm in the deep Pacific, which I've wanted to come to since COVID broke out. I've wanted to come to Fiji, Solomons, Papua New Guinea, um, a few other places. I got to Vanuatu. That was fantastic. And I think I just wrote a story on The Guardian about the cyber attack that they had there. So... When I told a few of my reporter friends, who used to be based in Beijing or now in Australia or DC, that I'm in the Pacific, they said, you've got to write something about China in the Pacific. I said, well, I kind of left China behind. I want to write about the beach, <laughs> the jungles. Um, but sure, I'll try to pay attention to see what this kind of new era of globalization is going to look like with Pacific Islander characteristics, defining a lot of the conversations. And I think that's the most exciting thing that I've been able to pick up the last two months I've been um, in the South Pacific is what Islanders really want, um, 
how we can listen to them better and also how Western media can do a better job um, trying to amplify those voices. So give us some examples of articles you've been writing uh, in, in Pacific Islands. Uh, well, the cyber attack on Vanuatu was a surprise because I went there for a conference of the Pacific community, which brought together leaders like uh, Prime Minister of Samoa, Mata'afa, the new Prime Minister of Vanuatu, Paul Sakao, uh, Henry Puna from the Pacific Forum. He's also the former president of Cook Islands, as well as a lot of other um, diplomats from Tonga, Kiribati, basically the entire 27 countries that comprise um, the Pacific community, right, including the Indo-Pacific minister from the UK. Uh, it's just a tremendous amount of energy at that small conference um, in Port Villa, but with the backdrop of this cyber attack. So I use that as a kind of who, side. Who would, who would uh, cyber attack Vanuatu? It's not so much in Vanuatu, the cyber attack. Uh, they have they, they have cryptocurrency. They've got casinos. They have an investment scheme where if you drop, I think, fifty to $100,000, I have to check the figures, you get a Vanuatu passport. So Vanuatu actually does have a lot of appeal. It's also a free port. Um, within the last six months, there have been major cyber attacks globally. Um, this one was less, um, the malware that I understand that was fished in there wasn't so lethal compared to some of the other heavy attacks that have happened um, globally, uh, universities, hospitals, um, even the Bishop Museum was hit a few years ago. Um, this is a new level of uh, crime. Was, and, was, Van, was Vanuatu prepared for this? Do they have the capacity to, um, you know, fix it after the fact and get back online? Um, they've um, since my story came out, they've updated it. They've got seventy percent back online. It did take them thirty days. Um, and to be fair, it's the prime minister's second day on the job when they find out about it and really kind of identify it, even though. There were some warning signs earlier in the week that something wasn't quite right, but um, sometimes in Pacific Islands, um, the technology goes out. So you know, <laughs> the net's down and the different departments, I think the uh, Ministry of Finance was the best prepared. So the Reserve Bank was fine. The tourism office was offline in a separate division. So that wasn't for the post office was fine, but the Ministry of Climate Change was hit. The um, <laughs> Who would do this? I mean, China is close and China certainly has the capacity as a state actor. Russia is further away and couldn't care, I guess, I would imagine. Maybe state, other uh, private state, private actors uh, got involved. Who did that? I've asked this and I haven't got a definitive answer yet from Vanuatu authorities um, about that. Um, what was taken, what could be held as ransomware still like I really don't know. I think it's just cheaper for them. I was told to just buy new software and put it all in the cloud and keep it more contained. Um, it could be anyone. It could be a 15 year old in Estonia. It could really be um, actors who are in a variety of other jurisdictions. Um, some speculated out of Indonesia, but that doesn't mean it's Indonesians doing this. It doesn't mean it's Chinese or Russians or any ethnicity. Um, there was a story about Cubans, a Cuban gang doing something. This could be anyone really. Um, That's not an necessarily interesting state possibility, act. isn't it? There was an article in the Times yesterday. You remember the Times, don't you? Uh, they're the ones who own the Boston Globe, right? Uh, Where I was a correspondent at for the uh, for the Hawaiian <laughs> Islands once upon a time. <laughs> anyway, there was an article about uh, how, how Cuba's uh, economy was failing. Um, you know, that has that two significant pieces. One is, you know, a lot of these people would like to leave Cuba and get to an economy where they can eat well or better. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that if you're really desperate, um, you know, maybe hacking, hacking will serve you well. You know, the investment is not that great and the reward could be very substantial. Yeah, it can be. Um, one of the things I don't understand about these malware attacks, it, it wouldn't be like I send it to my bank in Switzerland. You'd get arrested. Send it to my bank here. It would have to be a cryptocurrency. And I'll, what I've read is 95 to 90 percent of these uh, um you know, blackmails or send it to send it to some crypto account. But crypto is crashing, so it's not really worth anything. So I'm wondering if the crypto crash, <laughs> these are not led by crypto uh, crypto folks. Oh, and I think, I think of, I'm not one of them. had a better day. Uh, that guy um, was arrested today in the Caribbean by mo some local country. I want to say Nassau, but I could be wrong. Uh, okay. At the request of the United States. So um, it, it's more than just uh, making a few bucks. Uh, it's being treated as criminal now. 
Oh yeah, it should be because um, they can steal institutional data. Um, again, the hacks into hospitals are highly disturbing. If they could ever get into those, uh, you know, Internet of Things and start really playing around actually with like a uh, defibrillators or something like this and some kind of nightmare scenario. It's just like sounds like science fiction, but I don't think we're too far away from it. So why why are you in uh, Fiji now? Is this your first trip? Did you go as a matter of intellectual or journalistic uh, curiosity, uh, or or did you want to spend some time on the beach? What was it? All of the above. Uh, once upon a time, I was this sort of studious uh, uh, history student wanting to understand uh, the deforestation of Pacific Islands um, in the early 19th century. This is where Hawaii's story really begins with the United States and China trade. So I wrote my master's thesis on that. But the trade of that begins in a context. It begins in 1805 in Fiji. Um, on one of the islands I just went to on Sandalwood Bay, I went in the jungle, took some pictures of the trees. Um, it moves over to Marquesas, and then Fiji Marquesas run out of trees. There's a rush, and then Hawaii has it for 30 years. And then at the end of that, Hawaiians sell to Vanuatu to the island of Eromanga to try to get it from themselves. <laughs> and a very troubled expedition that had Tongans and rarer Tongans on the beach um, engaged in combat. Um, and the ships coming back to Hawaii, one sank. The, lots of crew members died from, I think, malaria. It was horrible. But it also commences in the 1840s and 50s. Sandalwood rushes across New Hebrides, Loyalty Islands, um, what's now day, modern day um, Vanuatu and New Caledonia. And then it migrates over to Australia. So you've really got this larger story of Pacific Islands and Sandwood kind of being a corner story. Um, me, I went to China to learn about what happened to Sandwood in China, and I spent 18 years in modern Chinese history rather than looking at it. But I just did a piece in the South China Morning Post Sunday magazine about the sort of long durée of Sandwood beginning in India, China, Japan. And that was from a chapter I wrote for some Indian publishers about conserving sandalwood. So the world history of sandalwood is why I came to Fiji in the South Pacific. That's kind of my ulterior motive, but that doesn't pay bills, but writing some stories along the way does. No, oh, but you got to be quick if you're going to be an independent journalist, right? You have to have the connections. You have to have the portfolio. You have to have the curiosity about stories that nobody's spotted yet. Uh, it's uh, So that's very challenging, no? It's completely challenging. It's mind bending. It's frustrating. Um, there's, there's out of pocket expensive. Um, it's hot. Sometimes you're you know, you run out of internet space. You it's very bad bandwidth. But for the Pacific Islands, you must be here. You cannot parachute in. Well, I parachute in, but I've spent two months down here meeting a lot of people, um, professors, drivers, hotel staff, um, folks on the street, just having normal conversations about what I should be listening to. Um, and one of the places I had a nice time listening to was in Oniara in Solomon Islands. And they're kind of at a literally crossroads where when you arrive in Oniara, they're like, oh, there's the Japan road and then there's the China road and then there's our roads. I said, okay, well, tell me more about that. Well, Kitano is a Japanese um, company and also they're, I think, uh, with, uh, I forget the uh, Japanese um, aid acronym at the minute, but Japan's um, Indo-Pacific strategy involves developing infrastructure also in a very concerted and open and transparent way. So when you get out of the airport, you turn left, and that's kind of like the Japan road. And it's a bit smoother, but they're still like um, fixing it because the roads there are a bit rough in downtown and are, especially with all of the construction for the biggest project downtown, which is the uh, new Pacific Games stadiums and compounds. And then you you pass into that realm and they call that the China Road. And that really is, that's a really bumpy road. So if that's the Belt and Road, um, I'm not trying to tease them all. So but, symbolic, uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> well, yeah, it is. And my friends um, I encountered there, um, ethnic Chinese said, don't worry, it'll be fixed by the time the games are open. I said, that's like a year away. And you're going to have a road like this um, poor Solomon's, when it rains heavy, um, a lot of the sewers have problems. So there's trash all over the streets. Even I was going to go take pictures of inside the stadium. And I had permission because I got permission to, uh, before I just knock on anyone's door to come in. I said, well, you can't today because there's so trash. Were you, were you born a, a shy child, Chris? <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, it's come. 
compensating for that. So what be- about the Pacific Games? This is a big deal, at least there. I mean, assuming everybody stays above water at that time, because uh, that's a real issue all through the Pacific, isn't it? Um, so, um, clearly, actually, what, what are the Pacific Games? Go ahead. Okay, so the Pacific Games began in 1963. So they're 60 years old next year. Um, they began in Fiji, and they're every four years or three or four years. And they bring a lot of the island communities together to participate in rugby and kayaking and a lot of the other um, great things. They're affiliated with the IOC, uh, the Oceania National Olympic Committee. Um, is a kind of general organizing structure, but Pacific Games is its own entity. But they, they work together because a lot of the athletes who go to these games, this is their avenue into the Olympics. So it's quite exciting for the um, young athletes, their families, their communities, their countries to come together for this. So this is a unique one because Oneyar has never ever had this before. And China offered to pay for the stadium. They said, yeah, sure, why not? You know, that's a great gesture. Is it a gesture or a debt trap? Well, that's the question. If you ask Solomon Islanders, they think it's a debt trap. Um, they will also say, what are we going to do with this after it is over? Um, Australia has raised questions with it because the, mainly, is this a sustainable um, you know, endeavor? Um, a few of the locals I spoke with said, look, we don't know where we're going to put all these athletes at right now. Um, they're supposed to be dormitories, but there's questions of waste management. There's, um, will it damage the water table, actually, if they suck up so much water and the water goes down and it starts with salt water? That's something a marine biologist was um, expressing to me that um, they're concerned. Um, I won't say who, but someone in the UN I encountered was highly concerned about human rights with the amount of labor that was being put into it around the clock to work. Uh, this individual said, I arrived at night. And I was on a very bumpy, dangerous back road. I go, yeah, that's 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 the Belt and Road for you, right there. <laughs> a bit. Um, right. I'm sure it'll be smooth later, but um, in the meantime, it's a construction site um, that happens with infrastructure, maybe normal. And it was just a glowing, glowing sky of white light, like a spaceship. You know, that was um, my impression when I first visited China. Uh, these guys are working at two o'clock in the morning. You could see the welders on the top of these yeah. steel structures, twenty-four by seven building stuff. Which oh, is, yeah. It's good in some ways, but in other ways, it's not good. Um, I did live there all, through a lot of the boom years. When I first arrived by boat from Japan, I took a two-night boat from Osaka to Shanghai, arriving by slow boat, if you will. And they were still building Pudong, and it would go all night. It just didn't end. Um, and it was quite actually amazing to watch. I felt like I was in a science fiction set um, for half of my life, basically. Um now, you mentioned that there was this um, this incident, maybe a number of incidents involving uh, uh, Chinese guys, maybe who were laborers on, um, you know, on building things uh, and the local people. And there was uh, unpleasantness. What was that? Well, I think there's a variety of things happening within the Chinese communities. You have your ethnic um, historical communities and then you have new um, mainland business people. And then you also have the engineers who are working um, for the state. And those folks tend to be a little bit more wound up, if you will. Um, for whatever reason, they're wound what, up for their- What do you mean wound up? High strung. If you want to speak to them in Mandarin, um, they are sometimes reticent to speak to you. Um, also remember, they don't want to go home to zero COVID China. And so they're very happy to stay where, where they are. but. They're under a tense situation. Remember, in Oniara last November, Chinatown was burned down. And there were protests because there were political protests over the recognition of Taiwan, which Oniara had flipped to um, in 2019, same with Kiribati in 2019, and for reference, like Panama in 2017. Flipped so, to China's side of it. Yeah, to a Beijing equation rather than a Taipei equation and saying basically we no longer recognize Taiwan is an independent country. We recognize one country, two systems, you know, um, framework, yeah. um, the one China principle. So there was a protest against that, and they went and burned down a lot of Chinese shops. And I, I drove through there and took pictures, and I thought this was a terrible thing. Really, you don't want to see ethnic violence. And the outcome from that was a security pact where China wants to bring ships um, to maybe uh, exfil their personnel if there's other problems. 
it's led to more of a police training context as well, where Chinese are bringing local police to train in China and then equipping them recently with uh, motorcycles and trucks and two water cannons. Um, Australia has had a presence training police for over 20 years, and if not longer, um, in the Solomon Islands and continues to be a force for transparency and training. So, but it looks like it's a tit for tat thing in the local press. And I think that's a bad way to read, a news cycle is a bad way to see what each side is trying to do um, separately. Um, that's quotable. Yep. <laughs> Basically, I think well, with Australia also, um, after I left, they announced that they were going to be investing 100 million Solomon Island dollars, which I think is like 12, 15 million dollars. I have to go check exactly the exchange rates, but they're putting in the facilities for um, a lot of the dormitories in the schools. Um, they're bringing over 150 athletes from Australia. Um, so there's going to be a lot of attention on this, whereas I'm still trying to get information on what are the other dormitories in the athletic village going to look like? Um, how safe are they? I just read that there's a tender for caterers um, and a clean management system, they're like green and clean safety managers that they're still hiring. So it's a work in progress. But uh, if you are a Pacific Island reporter or an athlete or a parent or community leader, you want to get a bit more out of this right away. So I went over to take some nice pictures of the stadium and I had already called and got sort of semi permission to do so, but from the outside, they said, you can't go in today. I said, well, that's fine. I understand if it's a mess and maybe it's not safe unless you work in there and you have a hard hat and boots and a special um, tour. So I went and I asked some of the local people, oh, can I come in? And they said, oh, talk to the boss. And it's a Chinese guy. And I said, oh, ni hao, ni hao some yang. He said, oh, you can't take pictures. I said, well, can I I said, I said, this is very pretty. I just want to take some outside pictures. The sky is nice. Um, and he started to put his hands together. I was like, no, no, no. Bukli, bukli. Like, you can't do it. He's like, what a gongsa. And I said, okay, I get it. It's your job. It's highly sensitive. I'll just walk out and I'll just take the front of the building and then I'll get in my taxi and I'll be on my way. And that's what I can do. And when I'm invited back, I'll be a good guest as always. Um, I don't like trespassing, you know, popping over the fence or something like this is not... You know, um, some journalists do that, but that's not. Uh, these are it's a sporting event. Like you can't it's not come a, back. You can't come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the long story. So what's the longevity is and the outcome? So he ran after me when I tried to take pictures, and I took a picture of him, and he put his hands up like this over his face, like he was a volleyball player. <laughs> I thought, okay, because I didn't. That's that's all I can do. I'm going, but. Other reporters from ABC News Australia, as well as Channel News Asia, have gone in and been chased away in more serious ways, um, with the guards coming over and yelling at them, um, threatening to take police action against them, etc. And I thought, Solomon's Islands is a neighbor to ASEAN and Australia, just as much as it's the United States. So I know how to behave with a maybe over-aggressive Chinese Baoan or guards. Um, but if you were a journalist from Tonga who didn't you know, understand that this guy's going to come and chase after you, it could be a real altercation. Or, yeah. um, well, it sounds like this is a story that that uh, is going to last for a while until the games themselves. And and you've been there two months. Um, what's your plan? Are you going to stay through the games? It sounds like there's there's plenty of news coming. There is plenty of news coming, and. I mean, it's November 19th to December 2nd next year. So there's going to be a lot of evolution in this. We're still waiting to hear about who's going to be the organizer of the press. I understood that there was a bid from Australia, a bid from China. And some of the organizers asked me, what did you, what did you think of it when you were there? These were organizers in Fiji. I said, there's only like four or five like major hotels downtown. Where are all the families going to stay? Where's the press going to stay? Um, I had a lot of um, headaches just trying to get basic internet going. Um, even the nice hotel I stayed at broke down like three or four times. And finally, I, I'll, I'll name the hotel Heritage Park. Uh, that's where I was able to buy internet and have fast and reliable communication. But I've heard other press who were brought there had similar conundrums. How can we report on this great event that you're, you're putting together? Um, 
Are you going to bring press from Marshall Islands, Guam, right? These places, Samoa. Yeah, well, How are you going to It's going to be television and cameras and and, yeah. and uh, international feed and a, a, a pool, if you will. Um, yeah. That's going to be pretty complicated. So why don't you put yourself up for the leader? Well, let's let's see let's see how it goes. I'm working on the story. I have to get more voices before I feel confident really uh, putting this together and just sort of brainstorming with you on this now is kind of a part of the fun because I think uh, your uh, media group can also ask these bigger questions, right? And also amplify to other regional and international press. Like here's some fun stories that can be asked and approached, but just take precaution and contact the right authorities and don't try to walk by the Chinese guard. <laughs> Well, uh, the bigger the better. But let me let me go back to China for a minute with you. Um, yeah. I just so exciting to go to China around that time because uh, you know for the first few years you were there, it was really open. Uh, Hu Jintao was a terrific guy. I mean, relatively speaking, um, Xi Jinping you know got a little tougher with his corruption, anti-corruption initiatives, and all the things he's done, which have I wouldn't say alienated, but but oppressed people and. Uh, you're talking about the South China Morning Post, and my goodness gracious, uh, life in Hong Kong has certainly, certainly changed. So being a journalist there for, what, 18 years, um, that's really something. I'm sure you haven't written out all the stuff that crossed your mind in that period. Um, but I, I really wonder how you feel about China now. That, you know, there has been a dynamic in China that's, uh, that's inescapable from say 2000 or so until 2010, wow, it has changed a lot and not necessarily for the best. Uh, what's your thought about that? It's very complicated to um, operate inside of the mainland. Um, if you register as press, you will be followed and you can't talk to people openly, so you can't get any stories. Um, but they're assuming you're doing political stories, whereas you can do bigger stories on culture, lifestyle, even just explaining history in itself um, in the early years was itself a breakthrough. We never thought we could actually discuss things from periods of history that um, maybe were not raised, certainly in the 50s and 60s at all. Um, and even talking about the Red Guards openly, as the Chinese do, was pretty amazing um, to people who'd been there for a long time. I speak with a lot of reporter friends daily who are based in Southeast Asia now, who can no longer get back inside to see what's really going on. So it's very difficult to gauge conversations. And I don't have conversations with WeChat anymore. I closed it last year, actually it closed on me. It's like, I don't need it. I'm, well, they're I'd probably listening to every word you say. Sure. There's triggers and they register foreigners. Um, one of the ways that one might go back inside to operate is you register and you do your job and you have your frustrations and you go out or you cover finance in Hong Kong. That's about it. Yeah. But there's some very serious lines now in Hong Kong about what is safe or not safe to say. So I have friends who just cover markets and that's it. Others well, it's have- getting, it's, it's, it's out of, uh, um, it's out of animal farm or um, one of those, uh, you know, uh, well, dystopian, dystopian views of the future it's happening with with the cameras and the prosecutions and the and the retraining camps more and more and uh, uh very very troublesome and and you know the borders are such an issue it's, it's not only taiwan there was a a border a border clash yesterday uh over the himalayas with india that's happened yes. you know a number of times so uh, he's pretty aggressive so uh, that leads me to ask you about Belt and Road, because Belt and Road is the most ambitious thing that any country on the planet has ever done in terms of infrastructure. And um, is it working? Um, is it is it working in terms of diplomacy, economics, um, political political agreement in the country about it, uh, oh. or is it just a a great big burden on China? I think it's a combination of things. It's had two periods. First of all, it's early launch in 2013 up to 2019, where there was excitement that they were going to be uh, putting in high-speed trains across Africa, and we're delivering them. Um, 
with COVID, that's been a bit slower, but still, last year they opened up the train from Kunming to Vientiane on the Thai border in Nong Kai. And I was in other parts of Thailand last year and early this year, and you can see, yes, they're putting in bits and pieces of these high-speed trains that will link up to central China and southwest China. Uh, with Philippines, they're going to build this big bridge from the city of Davao, capital of Mindanao Island, to Samar Island, $350 million bridge that will be built. Um, so putting concrete, and they're going to build these games, but how sustainable are they? For how long? Uh, different Chinese people have different opinions. Some would say, use that money for Chinese people. Don't take it abroad. Um, those aren't universal voices. Um, others think, this is great because now I can do global business. Right? I can no longer need to be in Henan. I can go uh, be a miner um, or a farmer in Central Africa. Uh, so I think the other element that was lost after 2019 is the people-to-people -people exchanges that were promised. So around Southeast Asia and the Pacific, they will say, well, these are neat projects, but where are the Chinese tourists? Yeah, they were expecting massive tour groups to come. Well, they haven't been around for a couple of years. They might come back, but in different form and maybe highly circumscribed, uh, meaning like you've got to fill out the form of every place you're going to. It can only be a state licensed um, travel agent. You can only go to these shops, but um, certainly in Port Vila, in Oniara, in Suva, and Nandi, the other side of Fiji, there's lots of Chinese shops, lots of Chinese restaurants. Yeah. Um, so are they local Chinese people. or are they Chinese Chinese? Um, most of these are a combination of recent mainlanders who've purchased properties, especially in Port Villa. Um, Port Villa, the Chinese I spoke to, they bought up lots of like the small garment shops like, all over downtown. They tended to be from Fujian and Zhejiang provinces on the coast, whereas it, uh, I got a mixed group of people that I encountered in Oniara from like uh, Zhengzhou and Henan and Beijing. Um, yeah, even in the Solomons on a smaller island called Makira, there were some Chinese guys from uh, Indonesia, but they only spoke Mandarin and their leader was from Nanjing. Okay. And they were, they were out there for like nickel mining or something. So, you know, you, you'll see a return certainly of people to people and business to business exchanges, um, which are what the islanders are asking for. These larger state projects, um, I think Samoa rejected one recently last year because it just would have given them so much debt burden, really. Um, I want, yeah, I want to ask you about that. You know, we, we've all heard about the debt traps and all. Um, and uh, I, I would imagine that some countries, maybe Samoa, is this Western Samoa? Yeah. Um, this is AP, yeah. This is, um, this is um, Samoa. The Prime Minister yeah. Mataapa said, they hey, say, this they say no because they don't want to fall into the trap. Yeah, that's uh, cool. and they don't trust the Chinese. Which, you know, which, and there's an issue about that. So the question is: there's, there's yeah. two things I wanted to ask you about. One is: um, are they getting resistance on this, you know, glorious vision of um, of, of of world connection? Uh, what what is it? One big family kind of thing, uh, all, all over the world, thanks to the Chinese, um, or or are or are countries um, happy enough to have them invest the money? They want them to invest the money. And again, coming into COVID period, uh, where everything was frozen, um, a lot of the islands shut down instantly, um, their tourism industries collapsed, they really need a recalibration. So th they'll welcome that, but they're also skeptical after they see institutes like Angola, um, Sri Lanka was a wake up call, I think, for many um, smaller countries. Um, others have better ways of managing them, but yet still have skepticism. Um, yeah, Cambodia other, had a good job, I think, overall. You know, a, a couple of years ago, before COVID, on that. a couple of years ago, before COVID, let's call it BC, <laughs> another time, another uh, world. Historians, but, terminology, okay. You know, in Hawaii and downtown, uh, there were some people from China who conducted a, a conference, and the conference was intended to encourage investment in Belt and Road. Uh, and this does not mean investment, you know, from either from Hawaii or from China, but other places everywhere. Europe, they were all there from Europe. They were there from other countries in Asia, from the mainland U.S., um, bankers, what have you, who, you know, were considering writing checks to invest in projects that were part of Belt and Road. And I said to myself, gee, this is really terrific. 
um, that they are mm, opening it up that way, um, that they're you know allowing money to come in, although they're going to control how how the money is actually spent. Um, then I thought when COVID came, gee, it's probably not happening the way they thought it would happen. They're probably not getting investment from outside investment sources, and it all has to come from China. Have you seen or heard of any issues along those lines? Uh, I think there's reticence to invest in it because there is pushback um, in a lot of um, Western capitals on it. And then secondly, this has arisen in the discourse um, out of China. You'll hear BRI mentioned, but now they're really wanting to emphasize the Global Development Initiative and the Global Security Initiative. Those are an area that the Lowy Institute um, in Australia has put a hand up and said, well, wait a minute, all gains for economic empowerment and development over human rights is not something that um, we like. So I think the Lowy Institute um, paper on those two initiatives is, is worth, um, I'll send it to you, if I'm having a read on, because that's the new language I think they're using to show that they are um, being beneficial actors, even though when they go and sit down at the bilateral level, they'll mention BRI. Yeah. So, well, boy, I think it you know, realize it'll be something. I mean, uh, I, it, certainly it's uh, it may have slowed down, but it's certainly not dead, and it's a it's really a fantastic vision. Uh, you know, from from Beijing to Spain, my goodness gracious, what a thought! Uh, and if they can pull it off, it'll it will change the world. Uh, it is. Um, they'll get some things accomplished. They'll take longer to do it, but they have the patience to do this, right? They have their five-year plans. Uh, I don't think they're going to be shaking this anytime soon. I think Kevin Rudd has forecast that she would be empowered at 20, 2037 or something like this. Um, so leadership change, I don't see it happening anytime soon. That's five years at least. Um, so they'll have maybe a recovery of covid this year and early next year with more vaccines, more firmly established, and a bit more of a, you can say, flexibility. And when that happens, you'll you'll see, I think, the first big ripple effects in ASEAN and probably Central Asia. Pending stability with Russia, right? All of the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, um, Turkmenistan, they're having more dialogues with Beijing, and you're seeing more business people go out there and what they that they put their trains across Central Asia. Um, I think Putin's invasion of Ukraine really gummed up their greater vision for being able to get into um, Europe directly sure. with the trains. But um, yeah. if Central they can get- Central Asia was, you know, uh, a thousand years ago and now a, a, an important bridge. Got to get, get across that. And, yeah. Uh, um, also for BRI, um, if you will pay attention to Peru, um, the port of Chanque, north of um, Lima, I think it's 65 miles or something like this, will be one of the largest ports in the South Pacific that will transform Solomon's, E.G., um, Kiribati, and Vanuatu, and other small ports around the region as they develop massive timber and mining trade and fishing, et cetera, out of Latin America. Um, there's been a recent coup in Peru, so I was like, oh, that's a red flag. I wonder what's really happening on the ground there. But 2023, within the first six months of the year, the port of Chanque is supposed to be open for business. That's another thing that the BRI has done effectively. So you've got this reconstruction of the Pacific happening, and um, that's that's a bigger picture to pay attention to. Well, you've got to you gotta give them credit, um, you know, as a country. They understand the value of infrastructure, not only in country, but to other countries and and the, all the leverage points that flow from that. I mean, he's talking about influence. He's talking about economy. Um, he's talking about world leadership, what he's talking about. And, it cannot and be re- Go ahead. Let's say it cannot be underestimated. Yeah, I think. And you and you understand it because you were there. You you watched it unfold and. And uh, you must have thought about this is my last question because we've got to go. Uh, oh, sure. You you must have thought about the comparison um, between you know these these fantastic plans, these glorious possibilities for China under whoever is running it, but especially under Xi, so ambitious, um, and the U.S. 
which changes government like changes underwear. And and every and every you know every administration is different. And nobody outside the country can predict exactly where we are going at any point in time and, and whether we could ever keep up. Um, so, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts about that after having spent 18 years in China? I mean, it's got to be a problem if we, who used to be in charge of this kind of thing, are now falling back in a comparative analysis. I like our balance of power. I like our checks and balances even though it might, it might seem um, like it's not continuity, but we have the continuity of institutions overall. Uh, inside of China, the things change very quickly. So getting a rule of law to keep your contracts is not so easy necessarily. Um, the bigger pictures, yeah, they can say we have a grand vision to 2050, but the Blue Pacific is also enabling themselves um, with bigger roadmaps like this. Um, U.S. corporations have big roadmaps as well for investors to look into. Um, many people in the U.S. would not want to see our state have 100-year visions for what the country is going to march on to. Um, I think we set a nice tone that works for us, and we think that it liberates and emancipates people ultimately. Um, and I'm very happy about that. Whereas China's system is different. It's organized for the Chinese people with their context on how they want to read the world. And uh, it's very hard to engage um, in conversations where those two systems um, overlap anymore. Whereas in the early years, my first decade there, uh, you could have much easier conversations. But now I think each side is more entrenched. Mm -hmm. Hey, I can't have a Ill, yeah. yeah. I can't have an easy conversation with somebody from uh, Arkansas or Missouri. So uh, oh, conversations are hard all over. <laughs> conversations are hard all over. I did have a great conversation uh, a few months ago with a guy from Arkansas. He was a, he worked in a bank. He's a nice guy. But, <laughs> hey, you know, Chris, I, I really want to do this again. I hope you'd be available yeah. wherever you are. Uh, there's a million other questions. We just don't have the time today. But thanks so much for joining me. And, and I look forward to talking with you again soon. My pleasure, Jay. And uh, thanks to uh, your tech team there and to the viewers there in Hawaii and abroad. Tai Jin. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.